It was a little bit strange putting together such a wintry thumbnail for this video when you consider that we're finally in spring here in the UK. But with that said, my name is Katia and welcome. Today I'm discussing Winter in Sokcho by Alyssa Joao du Sapin, first published in French in 2016 and translated by Anissa Abbas Higgins for the English publication in 2020. It went on to win the 2021 National Book Award for Translated Literature, an award that is so well deserved considering how brilliant the job is in terms of, you know, translating the language of the novel. Beautiful, beautiful lyrical style that came across here. While I found it to be a captivating novel myself, I don't think it is a universally loved book. Despite critical acclaim, it has just 3.64 on Goodreads. Um, I personally wouldn't go below four stars. Now, many readers probably dislike the seeming lack of plot and unresolved ending. It is a slice of life novel. It uses a narrative technique where the reader sees glimpses of the character's life with mainly a sequence of events presented without a focus particularly on plot development, um, a particular conflict or a definitive resolution. So Sokcho is a South Korean town that shares a border with North Korea. It is said to be a bustling holiday resort in the summer, which likely inspired the beautiful postcard book cover. However, there's nothing to do there in winter, based on what we're reading here, and the town is thrown into a form of suspended animation, seemingly bound in ice. This lack of movement, that feeling of holding one's breath, seems an excellent way to also describe the life of our main character. Now, our main character is a young woman who narrates a novel while working in a run-down guesthouse run by a man known as Old Park. It took me a while to realize that the narrator herself is not named, and I thought this was actually a clever move on the part of the author. Now, the guest house has a few guests, and it's a surprise when a French graphic novelist arrives to work on his latest story. The reason it has few guests is it's a bit run down, but also it's out of season, so there's not many people about. So why do I love the slice of life novel that lets us look into a particularly remarkable life for a few days. Though I say not particularly remarkable, there is so much detail that shows us that is not the case. So visual imagery. This made it divine, a real pleasure to read. I devoured it in just a day and from what I said about the lack of plot and open-endedness, you might think that it's not meaningful, but every word on the page serves a purpose. There's enough detail for the reader to find patterns and pull them together to form a complete or a more complete image. Much like the French illustrator who is trying to pull together his main character for his graphic novel, this woman of elusive form. The story is not as uneventful as it appears at first glance. While not driven so much by plot as by sensory images, these pages are packed with detail. It's bursting with taste, smells, and visual imagery, all of which, together with the subtle dialogue and internal monologue, provide a fascinating exploration of identity, the personal, cultural, and national. Now, the winter in the city offers a perfect backdrop for two strangers who form a fleeting connection amidst a sense of isolation. I'm now going to go into spoiler territory to share some of my thoughts on the story. The few guests at Old Parks have very particular reasons for being in Sokcho out of season. One guest is a woman from Seoul who's undergone plastic surgery and is recovering away from everyone she knows. Plastic surgery and this pursuit of perfection are themes in the story. We then have the arrival of Jan Kerend, the French man traveling alone and seeking inspiration for his latest graphic novel. Keep in mind the importance of visual imagery to him as an artist. In that case, you can't help but appreciate just how well written this book is in terms of bringing to life our unnamed character's life in Sokcho. We read about this man looking at a town and he's watched by our main character while he too looks at slash watches her. 
What I mean is there's a lot of observation. Our main character sees the world and the people around her in great detail, and yet the people in her world struggle to see her clearly. Going back to Karen, there's a huge gap to bridge between him and our narrator. Gender, nationality, age, and more. What connects them that each is that each of them is trying better to understand this world and themselves. Their focal point just happens to be where they're intersecting geographically in Sokcho. So we might not learn her name, but we gain such an intimate knowledge of our narrator. We know nothing of her father, other than he is French, and at the start I wondered if it was Karen, but anyway. She lives at the guest house, out of choice, and spends her Sundays with her mother as a concession, as the mother wants to keep her sort of close. Her mother works in the fish market, and the two have an unhealthy relationship. Her mother is not just like any of the other women in the fish market, though. She is the only person in Sokcho permitted to cook the potentially highly toxic fugu. The mother holds herself to a very high standard, but can't escape the gossips for having had a relationship with a foreigner and having a child from that relationship. In contrast to her mother's perfectionism, our main character is shown to lack attention to detail, which we can see when it comes to her cleaning and cooking at the guest house. In one scene, she cuts herself while prepping food at the guest house, and in another scene, which I've got tabbed here somewhere, in another scene, she's with her mother preparing food for her aunt, and the mother is preparing the potentially toxic fugu, and gives her the much easier job of cleaning octopus for octopus puree. And so we've got the narrator saying, this about her mother. Holding open the abdomen with the tip of her knife, she pulled out the guts, setting the toxic organs to one side and placing them carefully in a bag before she put them in the bin. She glanced over at the counter where I was working and suddenly cried, the ink! And that is because our main character has pierced the ink sac of the octopus, which she shouldn't have done, and which apparently is a much, much easier job than what the mum was doing. So you've got that whole, you know, contrast between them. Keeping on the theme of perfectionism, the narrator has a long-term boyfriend who moves to Seoul, training to be a model, having plastic surgery, and encouraging her to do the same. She doesn't want to follow him to Seoul. She doesn't want to abandon her mother. Perhaps she feels she does not want to be like her father, because that presumably is what her father did, abandoned the mum. When she tells Karen that she would like to visit France one day, he says quite offhandedly, you know, oh, I'm sure you will. But while he's thinking that and speaking that, she in the back of her mind knows that she's not going to do it because she does not want to leave her mother. She has stalled her life and she says she'll stay in Sokcho. This is a woman who has got so many options available to her because she has got various offers, for example, she could get a scholarship and do what she'd like to do. But her choice is to work at the guest house at the point that we meet her. Karen represents half of her heritage, but it is that half that perhaps left her with feelings of rejection in a world that refuses to see her as she is, a world that has not afforded her the privilege of easy acceptance. Now, while she yearns to connect with the world Karen comes from, she is also observant of the many small ways he unthinkingly fails to see and accept the world that she inhabits as a whole. He rejects her food, does not sit with other guests, and chooses Japanese ink over Korean ink for his drawings. She is interested in France and in university. She learns French and speaks it better than English, but feels too uncomfortable trying to speak it to Karen. This discomfort in speaking French mirrors her trouble in inhabiting her own skin. Uh, the discomfort is amplified if we think about the microaggressions that she is putting up with every single day. We already touched on the gossips at the fish market who still whisper about her parents two decades later. Later on, she's showing Karen around and an old woman comes up to her and starts fussing over her, causing her real discomfort. And Karen asks what the woman said, and she replies, we are God's children, she thinks I'm pretty. In this scene, the woman was trying to be kind. In the next scene at the museum, an employee refuses to speak to our main character in Korean and instead speaks to her in English. And she thinks, 
I choked back the humiliation of not being addressed in my own language. And this is what she does. She chokes back humiliation, chokes back her discomfort on a daily basis. When I mention this discomfort of living in her own skin, I mean her identity as a biracial woman in a country or in a part of the country where people will stare and judge. I also mean her body dysmorphia and eating disorder, which are hinted at in several scenes. Her relationship with food is binge and purge, love and loathe. She loves making meals at the guest house, but she doesn't eat much. However, when with her mother, she eats to the point that her stomach feels sore and she has the urge to throw up. Both her mother and her boyfriend are people less focused on seeing her as she is than as a potential, as an extension of themselves and their egos. They reinforce her body image issues. One says she needs to gain a few pounds, the other says she needs to lose a few pounds. They both suggest she get plastic surgery. Their comments are sometimes contradictory too. Her mother tells her early in the book to watch her figure so she can fit into a traditional dress again. However, in the same scene, we find our narrator binge eating. She feels sick but carries on eating and drinking and stuffing herself because her mother keeps topping up her bowl. It was always the same. When I was with her, I couldn't stop myself. She ordered another pancake. You look so lovely when you eat, my girl. Barely able to swallow, I gulped back my tears. It's difficult to me as a reader to understand what the mother thinks looks lovely when you imagine the character physically struggling to swallow. Or perhaps, despite telling her daughter to watch her figure, the mother is worried that she does not eat much usually. If that's the case, she doesn't seem to be the only one because we also have Mother Kim trying to feed her meatballs and Old Park helping her clean herself up one evening when she's binged so much that her tummy revolts and she is left exhausted on the floor surrounded by her own vomit. Add to this the Polaroid scene. So close to the novel's start, her boyfriend is leaving for Seoul. After they've made love, he takes a hasty Polaroid photo of her saying he wants to have a recent picture to take with him. Then he focuses so much on dandifying himself before he leaves that he actually forgets the photo. Not only do people fail to see her some parts, but you also get the sense here that she's become an expert at not seeing herself. When she looks at the Polaroid, she notes, The colours were still developing, portrait view, the curve of my hips in the foreground, a wasteland of ribs and shoulder blades receding in the distance my bones sticking out. I was surprised at how much. We go back to Karen now. He is trying to see the town through her eyes because it's a place he's never been and doesn't understand. She, however, wants him to be able to see with his own eyes what is around him, and most of all to see her. She wants to be seen for who she is, imperfections and all. I think that is why she is so fixated on his struggles to develop the woman he's trying to draw. A few times she thinks he's captured the woman perfectly, but he doesn't think so. So if she is the inspiration, does it make her as frustrated as it makes him every time he blots the image and scrunches up the page or tears off the edges to nibble away at it? The image on the page, the plastic surgery enhanced image in the minds of her mother and boyfriend, the guest from Seoul recovering from her own plastic surgery, all give the reader a sense of the pressure in this world to conform to an elusive ideal. All the visual imagery culminates in a final mysterious and haunting image on the last page of the book left behind by the artist. Another theme actually that I haven't touched on is the use of language. So it is one final theme that I want to just suggest here um, for the book, language as a form of communication, where language can be as much a barrier to communicating as it is a connection. And we see that in the use of English between a French speaking man and a Korean speaking woman. Her French is better than her English, but speaking in French calls up feelings of vulnerability for her. You get the sense that between them, speaking in English, there is a lot lost in translation. So as much as they'd like to connect, there's something 
that's working as even more of a barrier. She doesn't know, for example, whether he's joking sometimes or being sarcastic with her. You get the sense that the rejection of her food as well, so food is a huge theme, hits her hard because she would like to use the food as a bridge between him and her. That sort of thing where you don't get the connection between what you're saying, but you can if you're sharing a meal and you have that camaraderie. Instead, he chooses to buy sugary junk food, Dunkin' Donuts and instant noodles. So what do you think? Did you see similar themes? Are these patterns that you thought of as well? Or do you think there are some patterns that I'm seeing that you don't agree with? That would be interesting as well. Anyway, let me know in the comments. Do remember to add spoiler at the start of your comment. And that way, anyone who doesn't want the details of the book um, can actually skip over the comment until they're ready to come back for a discussion on Winter in Sokcho. There are two more things that I was actually thinking about and I'd like people's thoughts on who've read the book. The first is a comment on page 77 where it talks about a film called First Love and that it was filmed in Sokcho. I couldn't find it and am only aware of Encounter being set there and a couple of scenes uh, in Sokcho being featured in Business Proposal recently. I wondered also about the tourist shot while swimming by accidentally going into North Korean waters. I couldn't find any news about that, but did find an article about a South Korean tourist shot by a North Korean guard while at Mount Gum Gang Resort. I'm probably saying that wrong. It was in 2008 and the resort was operated by a South Korean company but staffed by North Koreans. North Korea claimed that the woman had wandered into a restricted military zone while hiking. Anyway, all in all, I loved this book. It gave me a lot to think about and it's actually stuck with me. So it's not the sort of book that I've read and then just, you know, forgotten because I read this um, a couple of weeks ago now, maybe more than a couple of weeks, perhaps three. And I keep thinking about particular scenes. It's definitely one that I'm going to reread, but equally, it's not one that I'm suggesting to all of my friends and family. Um, I talked to one of my friends who's in a book group in Malaysia and <laughs> mentioned this and said I wasn't going to recommend it to her. And she's like, oh, why? And I told her uh, why, you know, like certain bits. And she's like, oh, no, that would drive me crazy. I, I want a definitive end. I want to, you know, exactly have a plot and I'd like... A conflict to get over and just have that real sense of resolution at the end. So we agreed that I was right in not recommending this one to her. That said, I recommend it to people who have got the same taste like me. And I think it would make for a really good book club book. There's so much to unpick in here. Um, that said, it's one of those book club books that's going to be polarizing, I think. Anyway, Thanks so much for joining me and take care. Bye.